Ryan here with Dark Rangers Inc. and I am actually super excited about the subject of today's video. We're gonna take a break from processing tutorials as this channel is about all things astrophotography. We are gonna be doing a gear review about something that I have seen very little on YouTube, a sky quality meter. So essentially what this is, is it's something you point at the sky and it gives you the SQM number. Typically it's anywhere from around 18 to 22, uh, depending on what Bortle class you're in. And the way I found out about this, I had no clue that these portable SQM devices even existed. I was looking at a Facebook forum and I saw somebody reply with one of these in a comment section. And as soon as I saw it, I'm like, I have to have it. So I reached out to a company called Unihedron and Anthony responded right away. And now I don't know a ton about this company, but I will say I reached out on a Sunday and said, hey, if you guys are willing to send this out, I'd love to do a review on it. Within about two hours, I had a response and then shortly thereafter, a tracking number. So from a customer service standpoint and a responsive standpoint, these guys are on top of it and they are out of Canada. So my scope and now this are from Canada. So I'm supporting our neighbors to the north and I am actually really excited to test this out. So we'll do a quick unboxing video and just see what's in this together. Ah, no one cares about an unboxing video. Oh my God, it's got a bag, instructions, and the thing, woo, and it comes in a box, all right. All right, it's been about a week since I did the intro and open box. I'm in the backyard and I'm gonna do some testing, so I'm gonna turn the light off here in a second. I am um, imaging right now. Got the scope going. It's currently November 4th, so we're still, uh, about a week away from the new moon, so it might not be the best results. The moon is pretty close to the horizon. I'm supposed to be high 19s, like 19.8, 19.9, Bortle 5, depending on which one you go with. So I'm gonna turn this off so we can get a good reading. Real quick, I'll turn my GoPro light on. Sorry, I'm not using my, uh, my mirror list, but uh, this is what it looks like. It's just a one button operation. You just hit it, obviously it's gonna read way off. Yeah, 18.5, because I have the light on. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it off, and I am just going to go ahead and point it. Oh, there we go, 19.44. So that's probably pretty accurate, I would say. I would imagine that the light pollution maps aren't 100% accurate, uh, just because they are old data. So I think 19, it's either 19.5 or 19.0 is a cutoff for Bortle 5. So I'm sure that's about right. So I'm gonna drive about 45 minutes to an hour away to a place that's supposed to be like 20.6. So we'll see if it's consistent. If we have two different data points and it's equally off, relative to the light pollution map, then I would be pretty happy with the accuracy because we know that it's not necessarily gonna match the light pollution map, but if it's half a point off here and it's half a point off at another Bortle class, then if it's consistently variant relative to a light pollution map, then I feel pretty good about it. But in terms of ease of use and simplicity, it's like a 10 out of 10. It's super lightweight. It weighs nothing. You can throw it in your pocket. You literally just push a button. And I do like that it gives you the temperature too, because you know, that tends to be somewhat useful. So I'm gonna drive to a little state park. We'll check back in when we get there. Sorry for the lower production value guys, but it's, uh, it's nighttime and this is what we get. The point is we wanna test, does it work? Is it a quality piece of equipment, which I do think it's going to be, and is it worth you guys getting? So I'll check back in in a little bit. All right, we are in location two. It was only about a half hour. It took a little less time than I thought. It is visibly better. And so I haven't actually done the test yet. We're supposed to be at 20.65 according to the map. So I'm guessing anywhere from like probably around 20 to 20.1 would be the same ratio relative to the light pollution map. So let's see what we got. 20.06. Yeah, boy. 20.07. So basically kind of right what I would have thought. All right, so I tried a few readings, uh, 20.06, 20.07, and 20.09. Uh, so right about what I thought, and essentially we're keeping the same gap relative to what the light pollution map is saying. I would say it's consistently accurate so far. We might do a third place, maybe in a more light polluted area, just to see if the ratio stays the same, but I'm pretty satisfied with the results. 
All right, so I did test this out in a couple other locations and it was pretty uneventful because the results were about the same. This is about a half a point lower than the light pollution maps that I use. I did go out and get a moonless shot of my backyard and got about a 19.45 and most of the light pollution maps I have say it's a 19.95 or so. In the dark sky site that I tested, that was about a full boral class lower. As we saw from the video, it was the same. And I tested a couple that were actually worse. And the data was all really consistent. And given that most light pollution maps are based off of 2015 to 2020 data, and the fact that light pollution actually gets worse over time, I'm gonna go ahead and say that this is likely more accurate than the maps that we're looking at online. Now, why is this important? Because yeah, it's really fun and I like doing it. It's like a real life video game, as I mentioned in the intro, but it's really good to know exactly what conditions you're in because certain type of astrophotography really excels under certain sky conditions versus others. A big example of that is the quad band filter review that I'm doing right now. Antlia recommends that you use it as a Bortle 7 or better. So if you're using a light pollution map that says you're 7, but you're actually maybe 8 or 9, it could render the filter ineffective and give you less than ideal results. There's also times when you want to use no filter or maybe LRGB broadband filters with monochrome, which is really best used under a certain Bortle class. You can at least know that you're consistently getting the same results that you're expecting based on what others are posting, assuming that everybody's using good data. It's also really nice to give accurate information when you share your photos to the community and to know exactly what light conditions you're actually shooting under. That way, if you travel to a different location, you know what to expect on a certain setup. So in a video a couple weeks ago, I talked about improving your astrophotography overall, and there wasn't a big focus on gear. In fact, it was more of a focus on how to get the most out of your gear through education and processing. At the very end, I did give a high level set of recommendations for some of the big items like your mount, your scope, and your camera. So in the spirit of that, I did wanna cover some accessories that will actually help you get the most out of those big ticket items as well. So what I wanna do is jump into some of my other favorite accessories, mostly in the same price range as this, which is around $200 or less, and go over why I think they're beneficial and important. So for that, we'll jump outside to the rig. All right, here we are outside. As you can see, this is why I haven't been posting to Instagram as much. Thank goodness for Telescope Live. I'm gonna dive into some accessories, and the first one I wanna talk about is one that I get asked more than anything, and some of these will be things that I've talked about in episodes several months ago, but we have a lot of new folks to the channel, and I will be going over some that I haven't talked about before. The first and probably least optional in terms of getting the most out of your imaging train is gonna be the electronic autofocus. Throughout the night, the temperature is going to go down and then maybe even come back up towards the morning, as it does that, you're gonna have a minor shift in focus, which will not allow you to keep the sharpest stars and details throughout the imaging session. Also, if you're switching filters throughout the night, even if they say they're par focal, meaning they should keep the same focus between each filter, oftentimes there is a little bit of adjustment that needs to be made. If you have Nina, you can program in filter offsets or basically slight adjustments that it knows to make for each filter. But if you're running the ASI Air Plus, you cannot do that. So I run an autofocus routine every time I switch filters. I also have it do it every two hours as well. Moving up, uh, this one is really key. It's a solid state drive or something with more storage capacity than this. That way I can also stack off of this as well. So the images go directly onto my solid state and then I plug the USB-C into my computer and I actually have this as the output directory in PixInsight and that way all of the registration files and all the stacking occurs on here. None of those clog up my computer hard drive and then I just save my final image on the computer hard drive drive and the rest stays on here. I go ahead and just label them with dates and I have them in a safe spot that's waterproof. They're down to $119 for two terabytes, which is really cheap. And then I have one of these little Velcro things that I'll put up on the screen what it is. And I just go ahead and slide that in there and attach it to my dew strap. 
and it holds it right in place all night. The other thing that I use for that type of stuff are these silicone bands. Again, I'll put that on screen. And basically you can just wrap this around any set of cables like I have here with this bundle and it will hold things in place. It's also holding this USB 3.0 hub I have here by Anchor. I have two of them daisy chained together, which is super simple, and it is holding that tight in place. It's not going anywhere. I could do the same with this, but I take it on and off so much when I'm going to stack that I just use Velcro and I don't have any problems. All right, we're gonna shift the camera down the rig a little bit for the next things. So obviously a pier is really nice to have, especially if you have monochrome and you have this filter wheel. If you are trying to save your pennies, and I just recommend these in general, is to get a bigger dovetail bar. This will allow you to slide it forward more and buy you some time. Before I got this pier, with even this big seven by two inch filter wheel, I was able to run it without hitting my uh, tripod legs because I was able to slide it forward with this nice big 12 inch Arca Swiss on one side, Los Mandi on the other. It also gives me the flexibility to put it in basically any type of mount and it gives you a little bit more room to mount other things i probably would have gone even bigger than the 12 inch and gone with like a 14 or 15 inch if you don't have this type of mount where you actually have to balance it it also gives you a lot more flexibility on being able to slide this back and forth to get balance in the declination access so i would definitely upgrade to one of these this is by william optics prima luce makes really nice ones but this is the only one i found that's arca swiss on one side and then the traditional Osmondi on the other. Obviously, the pier is a really nice thing to have, and now I can run the filter wheel in any position, including down, and I don't have to rotate it up to avoid hitting the tripod legs. As you can see, I do run two power adapters, and I'm using those same silicone straps to hold it in place. I just wrapped it around, and it holds it nice and tight. Moving even further down, I have a 35 pound kettlebell. Now I technically don't need one for my rig, but this is a great way to stabilize it. And it doesn't hang out the side like a dumbbell. It's nice and stable. It doesn't move in there. And then recently I got one of these from Amazon and it's a waterproof lockbox basically. It's super easy to use. And then I have all of my power management stuff in here. And there are these little rubber gaskets. And as you can see, it did rain. The top is wet and it's bone dry in here. So I definitely recommend one of these. It closes right up. And then inside there, I have a Wi-Fi power supply with a couple different outlets that I use for both of these. And essentially what that allows me to do is turn the entire system on and off with an app using the same 2.4 gigahertz signal that I use for station mode for this as well. So I really recommend that. That way I set an alarm too. So every day at six o'clock, it turns off. Sometimes this gets stuck in auto run. And if the sun starts to come up, I don't want this pointed at the sun imaging. So it guarantees it's gonna shut it down and I don't have to worry about it. So I do have a couple more accessories I wanna show you inside before we end the video. A nice cigar is never a bad option as well. All right, we're gonna go over some of the little accessories that I like to have on me at all times and some of you guys might not be using, but first I do wanna talk about keeping your gear safe. I keep all my cameras, uh, not only in their little bags that they come in, but also in one of these Pelican cases. They're great for like field flatteners and spacers. They're really great because they're dust proof, waterproof and shock proof. So not only for when you're traveling, but also when you're just storing your stuff. When I switch cameras out, I like to know that my gear is completely safe. I use the Pelican brand. I actually just got one of their coolers as well. I'm not affiliated with any of the companies we're gonna talk about, but I've been using them for years. They are a little bit pricey, but they do have a lifetime warranty and they work phenomenal well. I've not had one issue with any of the products I've had with them. Another thing I like to keep with me at all times is a cleaning kit. And I do want to highlight one thing that you guys are going to think is silly. I used to use these pec pads and the solution that came with it, which is this stuff right here. So I'd use this combination. Oh, not the 12. That's the harsh one, but the normal one that comes with their uh, cleaning kit. But I've switched a while ago to this Koala brand and these are absolutely phenomenal. The nice thing about these versus traditional microfibers is they actually do absorb because they're cotton. But the problem is, is I find they do leave little lint balls and like little particulates that you need to then blow off of your glass. This not only absorbs better than your traditional microfiber, but doesn't leave anything behind. When you are doing any cleaning, make sure that you are using some gloves. I'm not gonna use this one, it's an old one. Even if you're thinking, well, I'm not gonna touch the glass, 
by transferring my oil to this cloth and then rubbing it on, I could actually be making the situation worse versus better. So even if you're not gonna touch the glass directly, just grab a pack of these gloves and you will thank me in the long run. When you're doing cleaning, especially with things like the electronic filter wheel, you're constantly having to screw little screws on and off. And so getting yourself a small Phillips screwdriver with a magnetic tip so those things don't go flying once they come out, this will save you a lot of time and headache and trips to the hardware store trying to find some replacement screws. It's only five to ten dollars and it's a lifesaver. For everything else on the rig, I use a multi-tool when I'm on the road. I'm not going to bring a whole tool set, but this basically gives me everything I need. It's a bunch of different hexes, torques, screwdrivers, things like that. This is by Crank Bros. They're like 30 to 50 bucks depending on which one you get. And even though it's for mountain bikes, it works great for us as well. Speaking of a cool tool to have. A micrometer is really nice to measure spacers and anything for like backspace. Basically anything that needs a precise measurement, it's down to the thousandth of an inch or the tenth of a millimeter. So this is really nice to have. They're 30 to 100 bucks depending on how hardcore you get. Another thing that you want to measure manually sometimes is level and the bubble levels on my am5 are actually not identical one is a little bit different than the other so i can't really trust them and i not only test it in one direction but a couple because it can be level this way but then off this way still some people say that it doesn't matter but i've tested it both in and out of level and i do get more consistent and better guiding when it is set up so take the extra few minutes and just get it right it's really not a big deal now you guys already saw me use one of these to blow dust off you want to do that before you actually touch the lens make sure all of those little dust and anything particles that are on the glass are gone because by rubbing it in you create micro scratches I've recently picked up one of these it is a two-stage blower and vacuum it acts as both and it does have a little air filter in there so it's going to blow out nice clean air you never want to use compressed air but this isn't going to be powerful enough to do any damage to your scope they're about a hundred bucks and they're definitely frivolous but if you're doing a lot of cleaning especially again that filter wheel a lot of times you clean the filters but then there's still a lot of dust and stuff that's actually in the wheel and this won't get it out unless you sit there for like 20 minutes this constant stream of air will blow everything out and that way when you clean all your filters and you put it back together you're not just recycling the same dust that was hiding in the wheel itself so i know some of those are common sense but these are things that i have around my scope and available at all times it's really nice to keep them organized i do have a cable organizer as well but that's buried away in my camping gear because I only use that when I travel. But, and when it comes to the star of the show, obviously I love this thing and I'm definitely gonna recommend that you go out and get one. Thank you, Andrew, for sending me out one. I'm really grateful for being able to test it. And if you haven't seen my video, because apparently the YouTube algorithm absolutely crushed it, I am running a contest right now. It's good until November 30th. It does have some prizes. So please get your astrophotography entry in there if you have questions on the details check out the video and the rules that aren't in the video are in the description if you stayed with me this long i know you're a real one thanks for staying tuned and until the next video guys clear skies <laughs> <laughs>